Yeah. And then, then we have there's, to do it. There's another Teddy, but he plays football. I highly doubt that he would go to. In the CM department. I don't think he's CM, though, either. That's weird. He told you that. I'd like to see. There's a new one. Who? Alex Hamilton. I don't know where he got that from. Because like, like I definitely didn't. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so I really know. I'm, 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 I'm not calling you that. Good afternoon. We have a guest speaker from Raleigh. Uh, his name is Bae Won Go. He's the architect. And he specializes in sustainable design areas. So you guys learn some of the sustainable design strategics from Bae Won especially some kind of lead green building rating system and you know, many different things. So welcome, Bear One. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, it's, a, it's a very pleasure to actually come here and then uh, share my knowledge and experience with you guys. Uh, I hope uh, this, this can help to you uh, on your career path as well as probably uh, for your school. Uh, let me uh, start with uh, just a brief introduction of myself. Uh, again, uh, he introduced my name, uh, Bae Won Ko. I am the Vice President and Director of Design at Innovative Design, uh, which is an architectural and a green building consulting firm in Raleigh. Um, we've been in business for 35 years with uh, actually about 4,000, more than 4,000 projects. And out of that 4,000 projects, a lot of them were actually uh, early residential projects with passive solar panels. <coughs> so when nobody was even uh, uh, mentioning about this green building, actually we've done a lot of uh, passive solar homes, energy efficient homes in the 80s and, and 70s. Um, our market focus right now is mostly uh, educational buildings, uh, K-12 schools and college buildings, as well as some uh, office buildings. Um, as I said, we are not only the architects, but also uh, consultants for other architectural and engineering firms because a lot of architectural and engineering firms actually got into this green building market uh, recently, as you probably know about this lead. So they needed some help from uh, some experienced architects, of course, and then we you know, get you know, phone calls and emails sometimes just out of blue, and uh, we just help them out. So we've been working with... Uh, over 60 other architects and engineering firms around the country. Uh, one of the unique things about our company is uh, actually we track, uh, we try to track the energy consumption of our buildings that we designed and consulted. So a lot of times architects and engineers just walk away once the building is done. And I know you guys do a construction management study here, so you are probably you know, wearing construction management hat today. Uh, and you don't usually see once the building is done. You don't, you don't usually see architects and engineers uh, once the building is done. Uh, we try to go back to the buildings and track their energy bills and water bills as well as also um, converting that into CO2 footprint saving. So this is kind of a cumulative number so far since our business started, uh, which is equal to about uh, over $8 million over a year, uh, per year saving. And and uh, that is equal to about you know 51 megawatts, uh, um, and then also we do a lot of solar projects too. Uh, our our founder was actually International Solar Energy Society president as well as American Solar Energy Society president in 1992, and he was a part of the Earth Summit in Brazil. So he's been very committed to this solar. So we've done. It's, we are not like typical architects that just you know, design buildings. So we do a lot of solar projects. These are some of the solar projects that we've done. Um, and, you know, combining those, actually, uh, the, the energy saving from all of our projects has been accumulatively more than 100 megawatts. Uh, we've won several AIA, which is Architects um, uh, Association. We've won several, like, a Green uh, Building Awards. Uh, the 1995 award was the, actually the first one that they started for uh, Green Building Awards out of AIA, and we got that award in the first year, and also about four years later we got another one. And then on top of that, we've been kind of getting more awards. All of them were actually related to Green Building Sustainable Design. And also EPA started giving out the Energy Star Awards to architectural firms who design really energy efficient buildings. And they started a program in 2006, and we were the, the only and the first architecture firm in the country who got that award. And we submitted another application in, in 07, and we got another award in the 07, and 
they just told us to stop submitting. So uh, since then, we haven't submitted. Um, and these are some of the least recent uh, lead projects. Uh, I just listed just the recent ones. And as you see here, I mean, we take any consulting projects if they uh, need some help from us. So all, all the consulting projects just vary uh, based on, I mean, depending on uh, their commitment to the sustainability. So sometimes lead, I mean, we're going to talk about lead a little later, but sometimes they are like lead certified level or silver level. But if we design our own buildings, no matter though the owner wants to have a lead certification and or not, usually our design commitment is at gold level minimum, and sometimes we go platinum. And actually, the second project, uh, the Sustainable Living Center in Iowa, that's actually off the grid project. So the power, water, sewer, everything is off the grid. Uh, we are also uh, a unique architecture firm that we do a lot of our own research. Uh, so it's not just, again, a typical design drafting firm. Um, and we were involved in, with ASHRAE. ASHRAE is uh, kind of engineers association for heating and cooling system, okay? And then they set up this kind of energy design guideline for different building types. And we were selected as uh, AIA's representative and we contributed to their K-12 school uh, guideline for the entire nation. And, uh, and then we were actually brought back in a few years later to even, uh, you know, break even more points, more uh, percentage saving. And then we do a lot of uh, green design guidelines for sometimes DOE and sometimes county government and sometimes you know, schools and things like that. And also, also on top of that, we publish and research and publish these design guidelines for, the, for other architects to use. Um, so we are kind of architect uh, for other architects and we try to kind of spread out our knowledge and experience with other architects. So some of the uh, uh, design projects that we've done for 35 years again. Uh, on top of that, these days, uh, today's, by the way, the, the main focus of uh, my topic today is not just the lead. I mean, I, I'm USGBC's uh, official faculty that I actually travel around the country and then teach lead. Uh, however, lead is not actually a, a uh, kind of, it's not a dictionary per se. And what I mean is that you don't take a lead <coughs> as your uh, really uh, a kind of everything that you have to look at. Lead is only a rating system, right? It's called lead rating system, which means you actually design, you construct your building based on your sustainable commitment or your energy goals or water goals, and then the lead comes in and then actually rate your building. That's the ideal situation. But these days, a lot of times, people just don't understand even how to design sustainability buildings, so they take actually lead as more of like a design guideline. The risk of that approach is when you take lead, um, lead gives you out certain criteria and then certain thresholds to get points, right? So for instance, it says, if you achieve this certain percentage of a water saving, you get one point. If you achieve more percentage, then you get two points. And then it goes up to like 40%, for instance, compared to the code. And then it gives you four points. That's it. There's no more points. But then people just naturally think maybe the 40% is the best we can do. But that's not the way you have to design the building. You got to do your own best for the economics and also for the environment. And then you go back to the rating system and how much percentage you actually achieved and then get the points. Right? That's the true rating system. Right? So, um, you know, when I talk about today, uh, I'm going to more uh, actually focus on what real needs are out there because I know you guys are actually searching for probably your jobs in a year or two or maybe three years. So I know you are very strongly interested in uh, finding career path. So I'm going to probably share with you what the green building market is right now, but also where they are heading towards. Okay. So in order to emphasize that, uh, I'm going to actually focus on more of the existing buildings than new buildings, and I'm going to explain why. Okay. So in order to actually address some existing building demands, we also do a lot of energy evaluations and audits. Okay. So that that's uh, what we've been doing, and you're going to actually hear from me a lot about analysis. <coughs> Let me. Um, give you some uh, challenge a little bit here. 
I know a lot of you are students and some of the faculty members are here, but let's take off that hat, okay? And then put an owner's hat. So assume that you found a job somewhere either for the government or for the university or maybe a big corporate. And then you are managing their either facilities or you are managing their construction projects. Okay? So from now on until the end of the uh, this presentation, you are a building owner. Okay? And then uh, I'll tell you why uh, these topics are very important today. So my agenda today, uh, again, I'm going to introduce briefly about uh, what, what LEED is and also then why existing buildings are so important. So you can probably find your career path towards that market instead of just new construction market. And then uh, I'm going to also mention um, a lot about this uh, IPD, or I can say integrated project delivery. Uh, integrated project delivery is a whole design and construction and facility management process for the life cycle of the building. And that is a little bit of market shift right now going on. So uh, you can find uh, your own path. And then also I'm going to uh, show you, okay, what's the, what's the next generation's goal in terms of achieving net zero buildings, okay? How many of you actually have heard about net zero buildings? Do you know the terms? Okay, good. good. Well, some of you actually didn't raise the hand, so just quickly, net zero means basically you don't use any water. I mean, mostly actually it's talked about just on, in energy these days, if you just call it net zero. So that means you know, whatever the, uh, the building is consuming the energy should be generated on site. So you don't actually bring any uh, outside you know, power to the building. Or if you actually use more power from the utility company, then you have to generate that amount of energy from your own building, like solar or wind. So the total balance becomes zero. That's what is called net zero building, okay? And then I'll just briefly show you uh, two case studies at the end. So let's talk about lead. Well, uh, how many of you actually know LEED? Good. Anybody who's planning to take LEED GA exam? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, one quick advice is if you take it and then you get that accreditation before you graduate, um, I guarantee you'll find jobs a lot easier these days, okay? Um, that's not only uh, the a way you, you gain a knowledge about these basics, about the lead, but also, you know, and I also hire architects and consultants in my office, and I receive resumes. And when I see lead GA accreditation attached to the resume, it not only tells me that that person knows a little bit about what you do, but also I can tell that they actually know what the market is going uh, forward, and then also, um, I can, I can tell that person has some commitment to that, okay? But anyway, so I'm going to actually then cover the very, very basic of LEED. Well, LEED is not just energy. A lot of people think it's just energy, or some people say, yeah, it's water, and I know some people say bike, ray, bike lane or bike rack, but it's just more than that. LEED tries to cover the <coughs> three bottom lines, triple bottom lines, and one is, of course, environment, right? because the green buildings save energy, which comes less you know, pollution and things like that. Very, very um, natural way to think. But every time I try to present this lead to the building owners, so okay, you are building owners, right? I told you to think about that way. So if I present to you, this is a new building scheme. It's gonna, it's gonna save you energy bills. It's gonna save you water bills. And this is my design. I'm going to have solar panels up there. I'm going to have a geothermal heat pump here. As an owner's rep, what would you ask? Yes. What's the return on investment? Sure. What else? How much is it going to cost up front? Exactly. You two covered exactly two most frequent questions that we face. Cost. Yes. Every time you do innovative things, people just ask, okay, how much it will cost? And as an owner's rep, it's your due diligence asking that question, and it is right. So in the green building, uh, especially LEED, it tries to address the economic uh, prosperity. It's not just for the building owner or the first cost, but just like you said, return on the investment. In another term, life cycle cost, right? So when you look at 
the building cost, a lot of people think, okay, it's going to cost $10 million today. I don't want to spend that money. I want to spend only $9 million. But then if your energy bill is $100,000 more every year, by the time you just spend about 10 years, that $1 million is now going even over and beyond, right? So it's a very simple process. And a lot of people actually look at this when they, when they buy cars, for instance, right? They look at the MPG fuel efficiency versus the cost, and they try to understand how much fuel they have to buy. But for some reason, a lot of people do not have that logic for the buildings. So, um, so this economic prosperity and, um, yeah, and the cost is always a good uh, value that we have to address. And then the third thing is actually the social responsibility. And we're going to talk about this a little bit about people, OK? Well, why, why, does, why do people actually um, you know, care for the green buildings? Yes? Uh, because quality of building can increase productivity. OK. Good. Well, he, he's going to dominate this <laughs> lecture today. Anybody else? OK, just again, you are an owner. You are not a student just listening to me. So when you want to move into a new building or renovate a building, what do you want to see inside a building other than the cost? Aesthetics. Aesthetics, yes. Efficiency. Efficiency, that's good. You want that building to fit your needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, uh, yes. You want it to enable whatever you're doing. So if you're having a bunch of group projects, there needs to be a bunch of group space. Sure. Sure. So let's say this lecture room here. What's the main purpose of this lecture room? To invite guest speakers then? <laughs> yes, good speakers, you mean. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> um, um, Yeah, so spaces and buildings have their own purposes and functions. Let's think about a very simple thing, like, OK, let's assume you are an owner of uh, Western Carolina University, and you are the construction manager or uh, facility manager. The basic purpose that you want to meet is basically the acoustics, maybe, for the lecture hall, and the good visual right, concentration to the lecturer, and all those things. right. And basically, what you're, th what you're talking about here is actually productivity, just you mentioned, students' productivity. How much of knowledge you are going to gain through that lecture? That's your productivity. If it's an office, what is the productivity? Maybe uh, less absenteeism, so people actually work more. They don't have sick days, which means healthy environment. And also, they can focus on their computers or something, which means <coughs> that you don't create glare on your computer screens. So that means your window design, the lighting design should be perfect for that environment, right? So there are those kind of functions that the green building has to address in terms of for people. That's what I mean, the social responsibility. Another, another uh, aspect of that social responsibility is actually affordability of the green buildings. Just like you said, the cost is a perception that a lot of people think that green building costs more. So when it comes down to especially the residential green building projects, people think green residential projects are for rich people. Um, we try to, USGBC tries to uh, make uh, all the residential homes, green homes, available to especially um, low-income families. <coughs> so amazingly, about 45% of the lead for homes projects are actually affordable homes uh, as of today now, okay? So green building, again, we just, you know, touched all three bottom lines. Um, you know, it addresses climate change, and of course, um, you know, resource depletion because we try to use more recycled materials or uh, materials reused and refurbish it instead of new materials harvested from um, mines and stuff. And also, of course, saving water um, and you know, helping ecosystem and habitat. And we just talked about indoor environmental quality and the comfort and productivity. And of course, you know, cost and operating cost. Um, the lead was, uh, has been actually developed throughout the last 12, 13 years, okay? When it started the first time, it was just a very simple rating system that every credit, okay, every category has had just one point each. 
then people complained, wait a minute, you know, if I put the bike rack, then I get one point. If I do a lot of stuff for uh, solar or something, and then depending on your percentage threshold, I get one point. That's not fair. A lot of people said that. So USGBC has been trying to improve the lead rating system. So in 2008, they started this process called um, weighting, uh, credit weighting. So what they did was uh, this uh, environmental impact from the 13 categories from EPA, and they kind of looked at, okay, what is the most urgent issue that we face today? So they kind of weighted uh, what the, the major issues are, and of course the first issue was climate change, and the second issue was then indoor environmental quality. So they went through this process. So the, the right side of that screen just uh, tells you which one was the most important thing that they thought. Then they went back to the lead rating system and they looked at each credit and said, well, this credit actually addresses climate change. So let's give more points to that credit. Got it? So they kind of did that. So um, you don't have to look at all this, but I wanted to say that uh, lead actually addresses a lot of different types of buildings now, as well as different types of constructions. And I want you to actually um, pay attention to green building operations and maintenance rating. I know it's not popular yet, but it has actually become very popular actually this year. They kind of started, the day meaning USGBC, kind of started pushing that uh, operations and maintenance rating system, then new construction about two, three years ago, and it's, it's materializing. And right now, LEED uh, is uh, developing, again, I mean, USGBC is developing be the version four, uh, and it's going through a public comment process right now. And as you see here, uh, they are adding even more types of building. So now the hotels and lodgings and also data center and warehouses and distribution, distribution centers are gonna come uh, in the next version. So this is kind of basic structure of a lead, okay? Um, probably you are not familiar with uh, these symbols, but these are actually the five categories, uh, basic categories. So one addresses the site, so it's called the sustainable sites, which addresses from stormwater management to the public transportation to the like uh, development density and things like that. And then the second category is water efficiency, which addresses, of course, uh, reducing portable water use. And the third one is energy and atmosphere category, which addresses energy consumption and reduction, of course. Uh, the fourth one is materials, which addresses like a chemically concerned materials or uh, encouraging recycled materials, locally harvested materials and things like that. And then the fifth one is indoor environmental quality, which addresses lighting quality uh, and thermal comfort quality, uh, daylighting views uh, and things like that. And especially for you as a construction management, the lead has two kind of different types of credits, okay? First and First one is called design credits, which mostly are addressed by designers during the design. But about 30% of the credits are um, the construction credits. And that is usually addressed by contractors, okay? And those are, for instance, like on, uh, under the indoor environmental quality, uh, there's a credit called um, indoor air quality management during construction and before occupancy. What that means is that when you do during construction, um, you know, you do actually, once you install your duct system, then you have to protect it uh, from dust and all the pollutants going into the duct. So conventional construction method was just leaving it open. But now just uh, green buildings require like uh, taping it up or just cover, <coughs> covering the plastic at the end of the, each duct. All the diffusers are closed and if you actually circulate the air through the um, HVAC system during the construction, then you have to change the filter at the end, and then also you have to you know, test your air quality at the end, and there are lots of things like that, okay? So as, as a CM, probably you have to address those, and you have to get to know those. Um, this is uh, the point, again, credit point distribu distribution. As I said, because of the climate change being number one uh, priority, the energy and atmosphere became the largest point section. And then the next one became uh, sustainable sites because 
of this public transportation um, regional priority credits. This is a um, kind of simple, relatively simple process, but the concept is LEED was developed as just one rating system for the entire nation. Okay? But as you know, the climates in our country is quite different. Right? So a lot of people complained, well, you know, in Arizona, we have a lot more serious, uh, serious water issue here. Versus over here in Southeast, we have a lot more humidity issue in the summertime. But LEED did not consider these lo locality of, of uh, environmental issues. So in 2009, USGBC started you know, offering this uh, regional priority credits. What it is, is uh, local chapters. I was actually one of the uh, members uh, who actually set up the uh, Southeast 13 states uh, regional priority credits in 2009. What, it, what we did was uh, we experts got together and then we um, kind of picked up what kind of environmental issues we have in our local areas and then we picked up the credits out of existing credits which credits can address that issue locally. So for instance, if it were in Arizona, they would probably give more points towards the water credits, right? Versus here, we are trying to give more credits for uh, energy credits and also Southeast is uh, worst states in terms of renewable energy. Uh, our, a lot of our energy sources are from coal power plants. So we try to encourage and then give more points to or towards um, renewable energy credits. So that was like um, regional priority credits that we set up. And it was uh, set up uh, nationwide. And in version four, uh, we are doing it again. And I was part of that too for the, for the state of North Carolina too. So these are the uh, uh, point system. Um, now just shifting a little bit of subject, why existing buildings are so important, okay? AIA 2030 is a, uh, a movement that AIA, Ar American Institute of Architects, is, is pushing. What that is, uh, what it is, is right now the U.S., now this country's energy consumption by sector shows that the building sector actually consumes the most energy. Uh, it's more than actually transportation. A lot of people has a perception that transportation is the largest energy consumer, but that's actually not true. <coughs> Our buildings actually do consume more. And also the construction uh, buildings, uh, construction sector, um, the economic impact is actually quite large compared to other manufacturing or wholesale, all the other stuff. And we usually don't recognize because we, we spend our own money on retails and, and purchasing materials and stuff. But actually, the, the building industry is, is the largest probably uh, industry that impacts the economic value of the country. And, and we've seen this throughout this recession now, right? When the home, you know, home market actually went down, it just started just a uh, fall off of our economy too. So this is currently kind of approximate um, cumulative uh, square footage of the, our current building stock as of 2010 okay so just uh, you don't have to remember the number but just that's about a about a box uh, that we had the building existing buildings in 2010 and by 2035 about 44 billion okay again <coughs> uh, the existing was 275 so about 44 about just about 15% of that 275 should be demolished because of the age of those buildings okay that's the market projection okay then the rest of it is left but then out of that leftover majority of that should be renovated in the next about you know, 20 23 years because they are just reaching to the point that they have to be renovated and then uh, the 100 billion square feet is about to just remain. But then because of our population growth and, and the projection, uh, we need an additional 125 billion square feet of new construction. So what AIA started looking at, excuse me, in uh, 2007 was, okay, this is the trend, which means out of this 425, almost 300 billion square feet should be built new or renovated that's probably in your career time right all right so what do we do 
And hopefully uh, you can you can see this. Yes. So what they looked at was let's say this is a year, and this is a business as usual in terms of the carbon emission in the in the air. Okay. And when they looked at looked at it in 2007. Our uh, C uh, CO2 level in the air was about 300, you know, a little bit slightly over 350 ppm. And if we are building and designing and building our buildings as business as usual, that curve is going to just keep going up. And probably you have heard that 450 ppm is kind of threshold that that we want to actually keep in the earth. If it goes above that then we're going to have a big trouble in uh, our ecosystem. So the AIA uh, looked, uh, actually Ed Mazria, one of the architects, uh, early architects for the passive solar homes, he looked at this data and then said, well, in order to stop this curve, what we have to do is actually we you know, try to make this going bad like this. So by 2030, what do we do? And he looked at this way, and because of that, uh, 125 billion square feet of new construction and another 125 of renovation. All the architects and contractors have to actually design certain ways to make this curve down. Otherwise, if we do design and build as usual, then it's going to keep going up. Okay, so he looked at this and how much do we have to change our conventional method? That was the 2020-30 challenge, okay? So, you know, after that calculation, what they realized was today um, about every building that we design for the new construction or renovation, uh, the energy efficiency should, should be about 60% less than the existing building stock average. But then every five years, you know, we got to actually do 10% more. So by the time 2030, every project that architects uh, design and the contractors build should be carbon neutral. That's the way that we can make this curve down. Okay, so that, that movement is called the 2030 challenge. And our firm was uh, one of the very first architecture firm who signed up for that, and we've been committed to that. So all of our buildings, no matter the owners want to do it or not, we try to design to meet this percentage, which is very challenging, okay, very challenging. But uh, it's been kind of successful, and I can show you how we could be uh, doing that. So uh, let's talk about this integrated project delivery. Now again, um, remember your hat, owner's hat, right? So integrated project delivery, if you are an owner, usually you select the design team through either interview or proposals, right? Um, once you select the uh, architect, and probably you're going to have a kickoff meeting or a couple of meetings for the programming and stuff, and, and then usually next time when you see architects is conventionally it's just at the end of schematic design. And the, the, the architects came back with their rendering, maybe, or flow plans with nice colors and stuff. And then they present, okay, you give you have given us this program and this is our design. All right. And then next time you see architects again is probably now, probably at the end of DD, design development. I mean it's kind of linear process. And the owners usually um, actually I've heard this comment a lot. Um, we pay a million dollars for the architect. Why do I have to spend my own time uh, for designing the building? He's an expert. He should be able to design our buildings. I just tell them what I need. That's kind of common sense and common comments that I actually uh, hear a lot when I ask them to be involved during the design. Okay. So um, the contractors. Okay. Now let's switch the hat. You are a constru construction manager for the con contractors. Typical delivery method, design, bid, build process, the contractors never uh, get to look at the projects until the bid, right? Then you guys put the price in four weeks, five weeks, and then 
Now you get to know the project. But then you have to build it, right? So that's the conventional uh, project delivery method. And the green buildings, if you do that way, uh, I don't have enough time to uh, share a lot of stories, but if you do that way, it's going to cost a lot more. Okay? But uh, if you do integrate the project delivery together, then actually we can work together from the very beginning of the project and we can actually reduce the cost down. Okay, that's what integrated project delivery is, is I'm going to show you. Okay, so these are multiple key stakeholders who usually are involved in the design projects, the green building projects. I mean, you can even add more. I know this diagram does not show inter uh, interior designer and there might be some other folks, but these, this, this is an integrated project team that actually ideally uh, then needs to be involved at the beginning of the project to the end. That's why and I've attended a lot of state construction um, meetings as well as uh, some military um, conferences. Uh, for instance, like U.S. Army or Air Force, they are moving towards more of uh, either design build or CM at risk right now because uh, of their commitment to green buildings. The executive order of President Obama actually set this bar really high and the military kind of right jumped on it. And in order to achieve those goals, they realized that uh, the conventional design build, build process is not going to actually make it happen. So I attended this um, the Virginia conference uh, with the military folks about a couple of years ago. They were showing me uh, their target uh, for uh, to change to more of a CML risk or design build was 75% uh, of all their projects. But 75% means all of major projects, actually. The other 25% are like a small or renovation projects, okay? So, you know, from just a design standpoint, how does that work? The integrated design process. Basically, the top bar is the conventional design process. And uh, just uh, imagine that the, the scale is just a duration of the, each design phase. So conventionally, SD is very quick, and then DD is a little bit longer, but still not very long. And then, you know, architects and engineers spend a lot of time detailing it and coordinating stuff uh, during the CD. Um, the integrative design process, on the other hand, spend a lot of more time during SD because, again, because of a lot of involvement uh, with the lots of stakeholders, uh, design charrette is a kind of <coughs> initial kickoff meeting, but it's more than just kickoff meeting, introducing each other and shaking hands. Actually, in design charrette meeting, you set the goals of the projects, and then be, and then it's documented, and that goals are actually maintained throughout the project. So if if during the design some decisions are made. Uh, you know, you know, actually sidetracked from those goals, then you go back to the design charrette document and hey, say, hey, our team got together at the beginning and we set these goals and we are now actually coming off of that track, so we got to go back to that track. So that's kind of a very, very important uh, meeting at the very beginning of the design. Um, and, you know, a couple of bottom ones, you know, energy modeling and life cycle cost analysis. I'm going to show you actually an example of our uh, integrity design document at the very beginning of the project, and you're going to be amazed how much information is in there. But then during the DD, again, DD is a lot longer than conventional, so it takes more time, and we re refine the energy modeling again. Energy modeling is a, a kind of computer software that runs the building as designed and then just pr predict how much of energy is going to be used by the building. Okay, And that software, a lot of projects they do use energy modeling only for just lead documentation. That's also, again, kind of downside of this uh, lead is uh, they do not actually verify how this software is used during the design. So just they just design conventionally, and then they run this energy modeling software at the end, and then they just uh, submit it as a paperwork. But this time, you know, you have to actually model a lot more actually to to make it as a design tool. So when you are an owner again, um, I try to actually educate the owner's side when we do the projects, but if you know these issues as an owner, what you really have to ask your design team is, um, this is one way that I try to kind of change the industry. Uh, when you sign the contract with your, your designers and consultants, the deliverables, okay? 
uh, the the conventional deliverables are just flow plans and you know specifications and things like that. Now we try to encourage that the owners should include these kind of stuff: life cycle cost analysis, the energy modeling, okay, and then they have to prove you how the designers and engineers picked a system like you know conventional uh, air chilled water system versus your thermal systems and things like that. And as an owner, again, if you do not ask, you don't get. So if we, the owners don't know this stuff, then you cannot get those. So you got to be able to ask the designers, designers and then just challenge them, where's your, where's your study? Okay? And that should happen during these early phases. Since you do a lot of those work up front, the construction document phase becomes a lot easier and then becomes shorter. So the overall amount of time is almost the same. Okay? Let me, let me give you an example why uh, we need integrated approach. The water issue. I have four, four pictures on this slide. One is power plant, one is a farm, one is you know, stream, and one is our uh, faucet. They all use water. How does the power plant use water? Cooling. Cooling, right? Yeah, if they don't have water, they cannot produce the energy. Now, actually, the water, water bill that you pay at your home, up to 80% of your water cost is actually energy cost that pumps the water from um, the treatment plants to your home and then pump it back to the treatment plant. The energy cost is actually also uh, is, is most of your water cost. So if you save energy and then you save water, if you save um, water and you save energy because if you save energy, then the power plant doesn't have to use that much water, right? So it's all intertwined together. That's why, you know, you know, conventionally, again, the engineers, mechanical engineers only look at energy side. The plumbing engineers only look at water side. But now this integrated approach, they have to actually work together, okay? Um, so what's the benefits of this integrative approach? Well, of course, again, if they work together, uh, let me give you an example of uh, how it works, actually, uh, in the next few slides. Again, the integrated design process uh, is all collaborative and nonlinear. So this is conventional that I've been explaining to you. The owner first probably hire a planner if he needs some master plan or something, and then they hire an architect. So that's kind of process, usually, and the architect is usually not involved in the master planning. And then architect hires their sub-consultants. Okay, that's just conventional linear process. And then once they finish the design, then they bring in estimator and then maybe just put the numbers. Now integrated projects, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, that's why I actually I put that uh, big circle in the middle. You know, with the integrated project delivery process, just the architect's role becomes a lot more and more, and some architects don't like it because they have to know a lot more uh, beyond the, their conventional knowledge. They have to understand some mechanical issues. They have to understand some side issues and all that. And sometimes that uh, integrated project coordinator who understands most of the stuff actually is needed for this integrated design process. Another uh, uniqueness of the integrated design process is it's uh, iterative. So once you set the goal, and then a lot of an an analysis is done, okay? And then th through that analysis, it's documented, and then you, know, you get the feedback from different stakeholders. And then that feedback goes back to your goals, and then if you, if you need to adjust those goals, then you have to. And this cycle goes around and around during the design and even during the construction. Again, as a, your, as, as a contractor or owner, Think about this way. If you are not involved in this, so you don't know actually what systems are picked for what reason, when you take over the building or when you actually take over for the construction, you know, chance, the chances of screwing up things is a lot higher. And if you don't know the intent of the design when you maintain and, and run the building, operate the buildings, you may actually screw up those systems. And I can see actually a lot of those uh, happening. That's why we strongly encourage the building owners and construction managers um, 
to be involved uh, during the design so they get to know what kind of systems they have to build and also they have to operate. Okay? So again, another way of looking at it, the conventional design, you just uh, pick the site and then the civil engineer usually just does site plan and then the building is, is usually architects are given the lots. Architects are not usually involved during the uh, purchase of your uh, land. But the land, the location, not only the location, the orientation and all the other stuff affects your uh, performance of the building. Okay? Uh, so that's the kind of conventional system, but the integrated design process, again, when you pick the site, you need to understand, depending on how your buildings can be oriented, the energy impact is a lot. So without knowing that kind of thing, uh, you, uh, you know, maybe you are buying just wrong lot. And it's very difficult to design a, uh, an energy efficient building if you have uh, so a lot something wrong, okay? Uh, and on the other hand, you know, if, if you are designing the master plans and if you do not involve the mechanical engineer and you do not allocate, for instance, like a central power plant size, then, you know, then you just hire the mechanical engineer later, and then he advises you, oh, by the way, if you want to do a central power plant, you have to carve out this uh, 10 acres of lot uh, for the central power plant, and it messes up your uh, master plan, right? So all those uh, inputs between back and forth is, is very important to achieve the uh, green building. Uh, one example, when you do design decision making. Let me uh, just pick the top one, uh, the lighting designer and the daylighting design. Daylighting, when we design the daylighting, uh, we just size the windows very uh, properly to make the, the space uh, you know, optimally daylighted, okay? And when we run the software, we assume certain percentage of light ref reflection from the ceiling, walls, or floors, okay? And that value determines the window size. We don't oversize the window size because if you oversize the windows, chances are you're going to get a lot more lights than you need. And then you're going to, you're going to have a lot more glare and also overheating the space because of the glass, right? So, but if you undersize it, then, you know, you don't get the benefit of daylighting, so you end up just turning on the lights. So you just totally lose uh, your um, benefit from daylighting. So when we decide this window size, again, you know, the paints, floor, finish, colors, they all reflect the light level, right? So we determine that size. I mean, determine those colors and reflectivity. But then, three years, four years down the road, I'm, I'm sorry, the, during the design, if you do not integrate with your interior designer, if we, the interior designer does not understand the intent, she or he picks up probably wrong colors, right? And then, a few years later, if your facility managers do not understand those color intents, they just change colors. And then it screws up the daylighting, which means then they start turning the lights on. Right? So this, again, this integrative design process is more of just understanding each other's intent and then try to reduce those. So as an analysis tool, you don't have to look at all this and you, you don't have to memorize this, but these are kind of softwares that we look at. And the 3D model starts the energy analysis, and it just in, in, you know inputs a weather file, and then uh, look at whole building energy side, and then just calculates how much of energy is used for uh, different systems of the building. So this is just a screenshot of uh, energy model, and at the end of the energy model, yes. Is Google SketchUp is that <clears throat> a relatively accepted industry standard or? Yeah, Google SketchUp is a pretty or, simple tool I guess it's not to Google. bring in the 3D model into this uh, energy modeling tool. Okay? okay, so that basically SketchUp has an export that will meet yeah. the day sim requirement. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So this is a kind of summary sheet that usually we generate, so which explain. I don't know if you can read those. Um, it just gives you, for instance, like here, every every row here, the lighting. Uh, the code minimum is this amount of energy, but then our design case, the lighting energy saved almost like two-thirds of that because of daylighting. So every category, lighting, equipment, space heating, uh, cooling, pump and auxiliary, and all those things. So they are all categorized, again, as a building owners. 
you know, if you don't know those numbers, even if you just operate your building for two years, and if you don't know how much of energy is supposed to be used by your building, you cannot evaluate which one is wrong, right? This measurement and verification is a very, very critical uh, issue right now going on among the USGBC folks in the green building industry. And this is a, a, a analysis example of design tool, uh, the life cycle cost analysis. The top seven ones are like uh, we look at kind of exterior wall assemblies, okay? And so each individual um, is a different wall assemblies, and we run how much of energy saving um, is achieved through each individual uh, strategy. And also we look at some maintenance and operation um, components of it, either it needs needs wash every five years or not, or things like that. So we look at like a 40 year cycle, for instance, this building, and then we just pick the, uh, uh, the assembly that just saves the more um, for, the, uh, for the life cycle. Same thing for the, uh, um, the roof assembly here, and same thing for the uh, mechanical system. So that's the basis of uh, how we make a decision, a design decisions, yes. So you said that's a critical part and lead presently. What do you what do you mean by critical? Are they having an issue with um, getting these proper analyses implemented, or are they having, or is it very well accepted and they're seeing that almost everybody wants it? Well, life cycle cost analysis at this point is not any of the lead credits yet. Okay. 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 I understand. So, uh, but this is a critical way that the design team should, and also for the owner's sake. Uh, should make a decision based on. So, right. <clears throat> so lead then will be looking at implementing a point basis for these analysis happening. Okay. They are, I mean, they technically uh, encourage this method, but this is not really a method for the credit. So a lot of people don't do it because even if they do it, it doesn't give them any points, right? All right, and let me show you, uh, Actually, quickly, <clears throat> one project. This is a small uh, public transit project that we designed uh, in Virginia. And as you see here, the title is a preliminary design report. So it, it was actually even before schematic design. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with what the deliverables is uh, for the schematic design, but usually the project, schematic design project deliverables are flow plan and elevation and site plan, schematic site plan, and probably one or two building sections. Usually that, probably, and then 3D rendering. That's the usual kind of schematic design delivery conventionally. This is again preliminary design report, which was, by the way, submitted earlier this year. Um, this is a kind of table of contents. Uh, it's probably hard to see, but uh, it, it documented project goals and some code analysis and then program, but then each narratives. But what you have to actually pay attention to here is this whole building energy analysis. Again, as I said, that energy modeling was done at this preliminary design phase. And then the life cycle cost analysis for all these components, exterior wall, roof, finish, um, some windows and shelving, all those things. So the reason that we ran those because we wanted to make informed decisions for the owner, right? And then even construction cost estimate and then uh, projection of lead certification level. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but let me show you one life cycle cost. For instance, here, exterior wall assembly. This is one, uh, and then we ran, as I showed you before, all, all like seven cases, right? Here from base case and then all alternate one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then out of that, alternate five system was chose, uh, ch uh, chosen. And out, you know, if you scroll down here, then it just shows you how we calculated, right? So it shows uh, 40 years of life cycle cost of the utility bills from that system because it changes the R value, the insulation value, and things like that. And then also just projects just each, each year's maintenance cost with the inflation value, okay? So if you look at over here, um, I have 40 years of uh, 40 years of life cycle span, and then inflation rate we assume the three percent a year, and things like that. So at the end you get this cost. 
So we do this process for all these seven wall, exterior wall assemblies, and we determine the final one. And then, since you can do it, now the, look at the cost estimate at the preliminary design. It's not just per square feet base. This is our con cost, uh, construction cost estimate again at pre, uh, pre I mean the preliminary level. It broke down into all divisions, plus under the each division, even it's more bro broken down. It looks like more a bit, right? But that was done in preliminary design. Division six, seven, I mean eight, all those, uh, you name it. So that was our uh, preliminary design um, report for one project. And that's pretty ideal process for uh, the early design phase, yes. So the preliminary design you just showed us, that was basically you taking your suggestions, right, and then plugging that into what was essentially an estimate sure. by, by square footage. Sure. Okay. Yep. So, um, and then the, you know, again, integrated project design, the key thing is actually document. Because you make a lot of decisions up front, and then you just keep documenting it and then present to the owner. And again, from owner's standpoint, perspective, you have to actually keep uh, receiving those from your designers so you know how they are proceeding and you know that they are sticking to the goals, right? So these kind of uh, documents are not conventional. So you have to actually ask those as a, uh, a deliverable. So now let's talk about uh, how we can actually achieve net zero. Again, as I showed you, the existing building stocks are huge, right? I mean, if you design new buildings, probably it's easier to achieve net zero buildings. But you have 50-year-old building, 30-year-old building, structurally still sound, so you want to renovate them. But it's very difficult because of ceiling height or maybe lack of chases or something that you cannot implement good mechanical systems. So let's look at what's, what's the most uh, economical way to achieve this. Let's look at the big picture. If we want to build a new power plant, that's the cost. In order to have about a kilowatt uh, system, coal power plant, about $3,000 per kilowatt. And nuclear power plant, about 10000 This is our study that we did for uh, the state of Ohio. Uh, they hired us to improve whole their statewide uh, schools. So we looked at what is the most economical way to improve their schools uh, energy efficiency. And according to our study, uh, the daylighting you know, cost is about $300 per kilowatt saving compared to these numbers. So again, saving energy and making more efficient is a lot more cost, you know, economical than building power plants. It's no brainer. Say, you know, improving lighting, even appliances. When your appliances reach uh, lifespan, just finding the most energy efficient appliances in the market, mostly Energy Star, actually even cost less. And then solar water heating is cost also less. So total cost of those strategies that we recommended to state of Ohio was uh, in average about $235 per kilowatt compared to again, building power plant. Okay, so energy efficiency is very, very important. And these are kind of common strategies that we recommend to our owners when we design either new construction or a renovation. And as you see here, the orange dots uh, are the strategies that you can also implement mostly uh, on the existing buildings, okay? Um, and out of those, I'm gonna actually focus on daylighting today because window treatments are kind of straightforward that a lot of architects can get, get done. And energy efficient shell means maybe on more uh, airtight envelope and more insulation, lighting, just changing, you know, better lighting bulbs and stuff. So they are mostly straightforward. I mean, I'm not saying they're not important, but they are uh, relatively um, straightforward and not, not, much, not many mistakes are done. But daylighting is the one that people make a lot of mistakes and uh, a lot of misunderstanding. So I want to focus on the daylighting. Another way that, another reason that I want to focus on daylighting today is because of this. Um, the BTU is an energy uh, unit, British thermal unit. So uh, compared to each dollar spent, how much of BTU can be saved, we analyze that and the affordable text, the solar electric, uh, electric panels is still the, kind of one of the most expensive technology. 
So if you spend $1 on photovoltaics, you can save between 900 and 1900 BTUs. If you do solar water heating, it saves more. If you do window well and the daylighting well, actually BTU saved per dollar is the most. Okay, that's another reason that I want to focus on daylighting. Well, the daylighting, let me, let me tell you daylighting, is not just a sunlight. It's not just a window. Let me give you an example. You walk in the classroom and you want to sit by the window. Usually people love window seats. You go there, you open up your note, and your, your uh, professor is giving you a lecture and then he's writing something on the uh, whiteboard. And all of a sudden, through the window, the direct sunlight hits your uh, desk or your, your note. And you are looking down your note, your eyes you know, got adjust to that, adjusted to that light level, and then you look up, all of a sudden, you cannot see the whiteboard for a few seconds, right? If you do just keep back and forth, and, and then you, you are bothered now by this sunlight. And what do, you, what do you do then? You shut the blinds, usually, right? To block that sunlight. What's the purpose of a window? Bring the natural light or look out. But once you shut the blinds off, actually that kills that function. Simple, right? So, or if it just it's not even just a study space let's say it's cafeteria again you just go to the window seat love to look out but then again you are a little bit feeling like chilly so you love the sitting by the window and then all of a sudden sun hits your body maybe first minute is comfortable and really i like it but then the second and third minute you start feeling a little bit warm so you take off your coats or whatever now, 10 minutes, you're still eating, and you become even hot, right? That happens a lot. And then people do, again, shut the shades. So the daylighting is not just the aperture. Daylighting is not just a window. Daylighting is controlled natural light. OK, that's the term of daylight. So in order to give you good daylighting for your task uh, spaces like office, if you're an owner and you have an office, you want to have a nice work environment that you don't have to shut the blinds, but you don't get the glare on your screen, or you don't get the uh, glare on your table, or you don't get you know, this, you know, uncomfortable because of this direct sunlight hitting your body. So that is the real, real good design of windows and daylighting. So imagine, yes. Um, you said you'd done some work with a lot of schools. Um, in my high school, almost every single room had a projector of some sort, um, and the blinds were almost always closed because of that. When whenever the teacher needed to use a projector, so what's a? You have a solution for that? You I'll show you. Good, Good question. question. Right. Actually, as an owner, you if you were the the uh, construction manager of school district, actually you really asked a very good question. Okay, and I'll show you the answer. Um, <clears throat> well, the benefit of daylighting, you know. Of course, the daylighting brings the natural light, and just understand this. So a lot of people have a perception that the, the natural light actually heats up you know, space more. But that's actually not the truth. The electrical lights put out more heat than natural light if you control the light so it, the light is diffused. Okay? If you are bringing in a lot of direct sunlight, yes, it heats up the space. But if you are diffusing it, then it still brings natural soft light. But the, it's, it, the term is called the efficacy, but you don't have to remember that. But the bottom line is that that, it, that generates the natural diffusion. Natural light generates about a half of the heat compared to our com, uh, fluorescent lights. Okay, So turning the lights more actually saves your cooling energy, too, because it heats up the space less. So if you design the daylighting really well, even the first cost goes down because, because your mechanical so system size is reduced. Okay. Um, another benefit of daylighting is productivity, uh, and then I can I can tell uh, talk about that. Which that's why the operating cost from the daylighting is also uh, you know very uh, well done. This is a project, actually the right side of that photo is a carrier, Springer Carrier uh, factory in Brazil. 
uh, we did this project um, about 15 years ago. Um, the productivity, this is, since you are a student, this is probably interesting. We had a daily, first daily uh, project in Johnston County in North Carolina about 20, almost 20 years ago. This kid actually torched his school on Christmas Eve, and that school was just burnt down. Okay. So they had this emergency board meeting on, on the next uh, day of Christmas, and uh, you know, our, our uh, principal was a friend of their board members, and uh, so, so he was brought in, and then the board asked, we need to rebuild this school very fast. Can you do that? Can you design fast, and then uh, we can build out really fast? So what he did was, guys, I'm going to design the best school that I can using this daylighting. And they were saying, what is daylighting? And he said, you know, if you want me to design really fast and then meet your deadline, don't ask me. <laughs> he said, I'll give you the best, best lighting quality, best energy saving um, school, but you don't just challenge us. Just, let us. just trust us and we'll design. So we did the first school of daylighting. And what we did was we measured actually students' test score. Okay. So we pulled out their test score before the fire, about a couple of years of test scores, and then we measured their test scores during the construction when they were in trailers, and then we measured their test scores after they moved into the new Bailey School. Um, it actually dropped down about you know 14 percent from if it was zero before the fire, it dropped down 14 percent during the trailer period. You see how important it is uh, to have better environment, right? I mean, the same kids, same teachers, same curriculum. The only difference was just teaching environment, right? And that impacted 14% down. But then when they moved into the new daily school, they became actually another 14% up from zero. So from the trailer to the new building was 28% improvement, okay? So we published that paper in 1999, I'm sorry, 1996. Then this uh, big research group from California, they uh, looked at our research paper and said, well, wait a minute, if this, is this really just a new building effect or is this really a daylighting? Because sometimes the people are energized and excited into a new building, right? So they wanted to study this, so they picked uh, about you know, 2,000 classrooms in California, Oregon, and all the way to Washington and compared, and Colorado basically, and compared kids who are in well daily schools, relatively good windows and good daylighting versus bad daylighting or no windows, okay? And they actually measured 21,000 students' performance. And what they concluded was that th those kids who are in daily schools actually learn faster about 20% in math and 26% in reading. Okay, so they, appro uh, they proved this. But then they were still questioning, okay, we understand daylighting actually gives this productivity benefit, but then why? What's the science behind it? So um, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is uh, uh, actually uh, my alma mater, they, um, they have a you know, top lighting research center, and then they came down to North Carolina, our state, actually one of our schools uh, in Chapel Hill, which is very well day lit. Um, what they did was actually they came up with these orange goggles, and the kids actually wore those, and, and these goggles actually blocked the blue ray from the daylight, okay? And the blue ray actually generates um, the melatonin in your body, which actually puts you into deeper sleep. So, and then they measured the sleep cycle of these students. And what they concluded was, you know, those students who wore those glasses actually had 30 minute, in average, 30 minute less sleep than the other kids who did not wear those glasses. So, you know, at young ages, if you sleep more, then usually, you know, your brain works better during the daytime and they learn a lot more, right? So they kind of learned this lesson from the daily schools. Okay, so this research was done just a couple of years ago. This is that uh, Brazil fro uh, factory. This is before the factory workers, right? They work in that environment. This is after the renovation. We brought a lot of daylighting, controlled the daylighting, so you don't see actually direct sunlight hitting anywhere, right? It's all diffused. And what they did was they studied also the productivity gain 
because when you work in this kind of environment, you make a lot of errors, which becomes you know, wrong products, right? That you have to actually bear with. So they just uh, looked at not only the energy saving from the daylighting, but also, but also looked at the productivity gain. And the product project was 2000, and by 2003, they made more money than they invested. Okay? This is a Chattanooga Convention Center that we did for the uh, um, Convention Center. Um, the orientation is, is, is very important. Let me, let me tell you why. Uh, just pay attention to this, this, gla uh, this graph here. A lot of people think that skylights are the, are the best way to bring the natural light. Um, it is true. It is true. If you just look at just lighting. So if you are talking to like a skylight manufacturers, Again, non-integrated. So they just look at only the lighting quality. And skylight is the best for the lighting quality. But in terms of the energy, it's actually the worst. The reason is this. This is a graph that shows you the thermal gains by window orientation. The yellow line here is south-facing windows. And during the summertime, the thermal gain is very minimal. And during the winter time, thermal gains are high on the south window. And the north window, on the other hand, just you get a little bit more of uh, light during the um, sunrise and sunset because it goes beyond the east and west line. Okay? But overall, just it's almost the same. East and west wall is a little bit worse. Look at this horizontal. Actually, horizontal works the other way. It's worse during the summertime and actually goes down during the winter time. The reason is simple. You know, if you have a building with a window like this, let's say this is your space. During the summertime, sun angle is usually high, right? Around our area in Asheville and uh, this area, that angle is about 79 degrees at noon of summer solstice, right? In winter time, even at noon, in December, 20, uh, in December uh, that is only like 30, 34 degrees, 33 degrees. So if you have a south window with a little bit of overhang, you can block most of the high angle sun by this overhang. And also the, the solar radiation okay, to the surface is, is totally depending on the angle. So if you are perpendicular to the surface, you get the most radiation from the heat, uh, sun, right? That's how this magnifying glass works, right? When you burn a paper through a magnifying glass. So look at this roof, okay? And the walls, I mean the glass surface, I'm sorry. The, look at the glass surface. During the summertime, this angle is so sharp, right, that you don't get much heat gain. But during the winter time, it becomes more perpendicular towards perpendiculars so that you get more heat Right? Which is, which is when you need the heat. The skylight is the other way. Again, summertime it's more of perpendicular, wintertime is more kind of this angle. Right? So that's why you need to think about energy and lighting together and then just determine these lighting strategies and window strategies. Okay? So, you know, some of the pictures that we did and then some of the uh, shots of the, energy, um, uh, the daylighting simulation. Sometimes in, if you want to actually integrate the solar system to your kind of roof design, then instead of having south glass, you might actually turn the other way and then having north glass so you can have this sloped roof for the solar panels, right? So again, so that's kind of integration of lighting design and the renewable energy system design. This is a, an example of non-integrated design of a master planning process. Again, you're an owner and you want to actually have an, a master plan. Let's say you are uh, Western Carolina University is, is um, building a new campus somewhere, and then you want to do a master plan, and your master planner, if he or she doesn't understand this, this orientation issue, then um, you know, this is actually a centennial campus of NC State master plan. And look at what they did. It, since they, the master planner did not understand the sun angles and all that, they actually angled these 45 degrees. 
and the 45 degrees off of the south is worst because of these sun angles actually coming from east and coming from west and when you have these 45 degree angles basically when sun you know comes up still this 45 degree angle facade gets the sun and then during the high you know altitude you still get the sun and during the sunset also this long facade also gets the sun so just throughout the day you get a lot of sun and especially during the sunrise and sunset the sun angle is so low that it almost hits perpendicular to your wall surface. Okay, so all these things, you know, if you don't understand as an owner, you, you set the master plan, and then once you set the master plan, when you go out and then try to hire architects for individual projects, you basically give them, okay, this is your building lot there. You got to design this way because we have already this road over here, and then not much you can do, right? So that's again another example of good integration. These are some common daylighting mistakes. So look at the first photo. This is a kind of a shading device over there. By the way, uh, this is a very uh, expensive uh, building and this facade is actually facing north. Which means sun doesn't actually shine there much and then you don't need this shading device. So this shading device is totally a waste of money because the architect didn't understand this function. This is another project. Oh, this are, by the way, these are all high-end projects. I'm sorry. Uh, this is another project. This long window wall is facing west, and he, you know, this building has this long, I mean, deep walkway in front of it, and the architect thought this deep walkway could probably shadow shade this window. However, again, when sun goes west, it's almost horizontal. Sometimes when you drive, you know, against the sun, you cannot even drive, right? So there's no way that you can shade that. So look at what the you know what the students did. They just put the newspaper. Just <laughs> um, a simple example over here. This is relatively well designed uh, light shelf. The problem is that this light shelf the, was designed at the same width as the window, but sun is not always like directly perpendicular to the window. It comes from the side and then goes up high and then goes down to the side again, right? So when, when sun comes up through the side, what happens is that these first two windows do not get any shadow from this device because it's shadowing the other way, right? This is another wrong example. He has this curtain wall. One, one side is south and the other side is east. And again, east angle is a lot deeper, but he has the same just, um, the same device, just no matter what the orientation is. Yes. Let them carry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another mistake. You know, this is a long window. Long window. And look at the, the depth of the shadow here from this device. Yeah. This is a not, not a cheap device here. But it's shadowing only this much, which actually is not a glass. It's a spandrel panel, solid panel. Glass is be actually below that. But this device is shadowing here. If this device were actually here, it could actually shadow the window. And also, these windows are all facing the same way, but there's no shadowing device outside. So look at that all this. It's hard to see, but a lot of windows have now the sh shades down. This is a skylight. Bad example of skylight. <laughs> okay. Again, same thing. And this one, you know, he thought actually quite well so he had this daylighting window, upper window, and the lower window. The problem is that he used the same type of glazing. So that's another mistake. Again, that's the space of inside. This is another example. And I'm going to show you actually some of the buildings that you are familiar with. This is your building on your campus. Mm -hmm. you see that? I mean, who's looking out that window? Nobody. Almost nobody except for just one person. And these, these offices actually do not have shades down because of these trees. Right? So since they have this, this shade, shadow from tree, they actually open up the shade, shades and then they look up. Right? Another your building, same thing, this device. <laughs> going around in the whole curtain wall. Uh, I'm sure that space is, is heated up during the summertime, very, very high. So um, again, out of a lot of building materials, window actually is the worst material in terms of insulation value, right? So, but the architects love curtain walls and lots of glasses. 
right? So uh, oversized glasses create a lot of problems for your energy efficiency. But people love good aesthetics, so I'm not undervaluing that uh, aesthetic side. But just in terms of uh, optimizing glass size, this is kind of rule of thumb. So if you are, uh, if you want a daylight, good, good size of classroom, and the glass size for the south facing glass should be about 7 to 11% of um, your, your floor area. And on top of that, the, the type of glazing is very important. Because a lot of people love low E glass. So they put low E glass everywhere. And if they have, some, some people also like tinted glass. So they love just tinted glass everywhere. But actually, t it's, it's going the other way. If you are using low E glass or tinted glass, chances are that light transmittance is, is lower than clear glass. So if you want to bring good daylighting with some kind of control, actually you want to use clear glazing because you know, compared to the same square footage of glass, you are bringing in more daylighting through the clear glass, which means in order to achieve like 50 foot candle level of lighting level, if you are using low E glass, you need let's say 100 square feet of glass or 1,000 square feet of classroom, something like that. If you are using clear glass, you can go down to maybe 70 square feet of clear glass. And as I said, glass is the worst material in terms of insulation value. Right? So if you are using less glass, then probably your energy efficiency goes up. Right? So uh, this chart kind of shows you, depending on the function of the space and the function of the view versus daylighting, you have to selectively um, choose different types of glass. Okay, I already uh, talked about interior colors. This is, by the way, some of the photos that we did. You just asked me about... Um, the projection screen here. You know, one thing that I we learned, this is kind of our uh, own pattern system for the interior light shelf. So this is a classroom that we have this high window up there, and this translucent cur curved light shelf actually diffuses the light, and we look, looked at the angle of that. So when we designed that system, if this is the window, and if we have this curved light shelf here, and our ceiling is this way for the for the uh, classroom. Um, what we looked at is we looked at all sun angles throughout the year, and then make, made sure that this this curved light shelf actually cut every angle of the sunlight. So there's no direct sunlight coming into the classroom. So it's always diffused throughout the year. It doesn't hit kids kids eyes. Okay, but then your question about this projection screen is the, our solution is this way. Look at this a little bit darker color, which observes the lights. Mm -hmm. and this is our projection screen. And this is their TV okay, at, the, at this darkened corner. Okay? And it's facing, the TV is facing against this window, so there's no reflection on the TV screen. And this portion, I mean, you don't see really well, but this portion you can see a little bit of dark walls over here, right? Because we have this soffit about this depth, okay? So that naturally darkens up the teaching wall so they don't have to shut down the blinds, okay? That was kind of architectural solution for that. Um, also, exterior roofing is important. Again, if, if I have a space like, like this one here, here with the daylighting, then this roof surface, if we do that with the white roof, right roof also reflects the lights back so it doesn't actually gain the thermal energy through the roof, but also it actually bounces light back through my window. Okay, so that's another kind of light shelf thing. Another strategy that we use a lot is these kind of baffles. Okay, and if we don't have that, just like this one, the direct sunlight comes through, but we just have those baffles that cuts every angle of the sunlight throughout the year. It's white color, so it diffuses the light into the space. Usually this light monitor is at the center of the building, center of the space, so it brings the lights very well. And all these other technologies and uh, considerations are way, way beyond just normal, um, normal jobs that you, you can see. Um, our new day lighting design, just like we, I said, uh, we just patented this system, so we built a mock-up and tested it, and that's uh, some photos uh, that we were actually building the mock-up, and finally it was installed in, uh, in schools, and it has been installed uh, at probably about 10 schools. 
this is another cost study we did. So another integrated process, again, as an example. Um, no, we are running out of time, but uh, the flat roof with overhead, the mechanical system versus sloped roof with overhead and mechanical system. And um, this is a sloped roof with the daylighting at the top with the actually uh, on the floor air distribution system. So the, the ceiling plenum is down um, and blah, blah, blah. So we actually uh, compared the five systems, working with the mechanical engineer for the mechanical systems and the daylighting, which we do, and the architectural design. And then we studied what's the best way to make it more economical. And just you know, this idea was still $2.70 more than the conventional design. But when we ran the life cycle cost, then it became more economical. So that's why we decided to do that. Um, the reason that uh, we came up with that bulkhead, the soffit solution for the projection screen is at early, early designs that we did, we actually provided these shades at the top windows. The problem is um, just it's people's behavior. We also learned a lot that even if you design with a good intent, the behavior doesn't follow that, and that screws up. So once they actually uh, shades, you know, put the shades down over there at the top window, they just tend to forget about just putting that back up. So it remains just closed all the time, and then they turn the lights on. That's a lot easier than them just going up there and then just you know adjust it, right? That's why we started just creating this bulkhead here, and then we ran. I mean, this is section, good section of it. But that that kind of shading shades that area becomes dark, and we measured that uh, light level over there. The teaching space is of between 50 and 75 foot candles, but the teaching wall is not that high, so people can still see it without darkening the space. Um, these are some minor coordinations uh, that I'm going to skip. Another thing that in order to, again, still keeping your owner's head. So let's say you have good daylighting design. So when you even renovate, then you can, when you renovate, if your windows are old, then you can actually selectively choose, again, the glazing types, or you know, depending on your analysis, uh, you can probably reduce your uh, opening sizes, right? And then adding more insulation panels and things like that. So let's say you did that. Another thing that people really actually forget about is this uh, plug loads. Plug loads means just anything that you plug to the wall after your building is done. And we looked at vending machines actually for a lot of schools. And amazingly, actually, vending machines are energy hogs. Uh, I know it's very convenient for people, but uh, uh, vending machines are very energy hog. And then also kitchen freezers and the classrooms, a lot of computers and monitors and TVs and projectors, if you do not pay attention to those energy efficiencies, that goes up a lot. So we looked at those and realized that that's about 9,000 BTU per square foot year. And typical uh, K-12 schools in Ohio was uh, 51,000 BTU. So that's almost, the, that plug load is almost like 18% of your load, okay? Um, and then uh, let's say you did all the other energy efficiency stuff, okay? I skipped all the other kind of straightforward energy efficiency uh, strategies. So now your building is the most efficient building that you can ever do with your design team, okay? Now you, you achieved that. But in order to go to the net zero, you are still consuming some energy. So how do you go to net zero? Then you start integrating renewable energy. Right? I presented this just a few slides ahead. Again, daylighting is the most cost economical, uh, cost efficient in terms of dollar per BTU saving. I'm sorry, BTU saving per dollar. The next is uh, solar hot water system. And then geothermal. And then but the affordable take system, okay? So this, but a lot of people think the affordable take system is the coolest thing. And when they think about green building, they just naturally think about solar panels. But actually, solar panels should be the last resort that you want to have. And the first thing is, again, energy efficiency, envelope, window size. If it's a new building orientation, if it's an existing building, think about shading device. Again, another example of integration. You know, you saw this, uh, you know, Kimball Hall, Kimball Hall, right? Uh, with that tree in front of that window. So if you are designing that building at the very beginning 
And if you integrated that strategy with your landscape architect, and the landscape architect understood kind of certain you know function of those windows, and he could plant right size of trees that can grow probably that height on, up until like five years or ten years, right? Um, that's another integration. But usually, what happens during the conventional is that architect designs the building, give it to landscape architect, and he starts plugging in all these circles, which represents the t trees, and that's it. And the landscape architect does not look at the building elevation, does not understand the lighting scheme, so he doesn't plant strategically about these plant heights and stuff, right? That's another example. So um, I'm going to just skip this, just but uh, if you become, if you get hired by owner, okay, or developer, think about this. This is called the solar developer package. And because of tax incentives, this is not known very well, but because of tax incentives of renewable energy systems, especially for the solar, there are lots of renewable energy developers who wants to come to your campus or your facility, okay? And then they want to use either your land or your roof and then install the solar systems for free. And they own it, they maintain it, and they run that system, okay? And they take the advantage of the, all the tax credits. So they make money, okay? But these solar systems are about 30 years lifespan. But because of these tax credits, they can make a good money in about seven years because they sell the renewable energy certificates to the power companies um, and the, all the tax incentives. And then about year seven, what they do is, and then what you as an owner uh, do is actually you lease your land or roof to that person so you actually make some money for the six years okay so it's your money maker but then at the year seven then the ownership t is turned over to you and then you because that developer already made the good money he just uh, sells that uh, system to you at very reasonable price it's not it's not a uh, you know at the installation price it, it goes down really fast okay and then you buy at very cheap price, and then you have still about 20 years, another 13 years of contract that you carried over from your solar developer, that contract with utility company, that you still sell that renewable power to that utility company, and you make money, okay? And then if that contract, 20 year contract, is over, and you have another 10 years of life of that solar panel, that you can use that renewable energy for your own building, yes? I mean, if the company that you're the solar developer can make money while still doing the the maintenance and everything, I imagine the maintenance costs can't be that excessive that the whatever company is leasing very, out the roof. Very low. Very low. Okay. Yeah, very low. Yes. So that's kind of scheme that um, that's going on. So I'm going to show you two case studies, and then I'm going to wrap up the presentation. So this is uh, nearby. Uh, it's in Haywood County just uh, outside of Asheville, I'm sorry, um, Waynesville. Uh, it's a 41,000 square feet, two-story building for their creative arts program. It's actually wrapping up the construction right now. And I know uh, Professor Ahn was trying to organize a tour of this building with you guys. But the you know, contractor is very busy right now, uh, try to finish up the building and then open up by January. So uh, we couldn't actually bother that much. So uh, hopefully we can do that uh, next semester. Um, as you see here, the roof is all, your whole roof is covered by solar panels, and this is a solar developer project. So Haywood Community College did not uh, spend any money on this. It's all uh, spent by the solar developer. So it's a 112 kilowatt of PV system, 152 solar collectors that is used for space cooling and heating. Okay, and then uh, that is the solar tank there that stores the hot water. And also we have a small solar hot water system for domestic hot water for uh, washing your hands and things like that. And on top of that, that building has really high insulation value of the uh, envelope. That's our 30, excuse me, walls and roofs. A lot of thermal mass. Thermal mass is a material, the solid material basically that absorbs the heat 
and then release gradually. So we used a lot of concrete uh, block here, um, and eight inch CMU wall usually stores heat for about eight years. So there's a lack of eight years. So if your outdoor temperature goes like in the morning it goes up and then at noon to kind of one o'clock it peaks high and then goes down during the night. If that's the outdoor temperature, if you have a thermal mass inside a building, that building stores the heat. So these heats are actually kind of lacked. So the indoor temperature goes like this. So during the noon, actually your, your temperature, indoor temperature is not as high as it could be. Okay, and then by the time, you know, because this is about eight hours lag, as I said, by the time the outdoor temperature is this, actually your peak height inside is going to be about 7, 8 p.m. maybe. And most time that, you know, you, you are not using that building. And then, then that heat is released at night, and then it heats up the, the space during the night, so when you come in in the morning, actually that indoor temperature is warmer than, um, than it should have been. I mean, it could have been. So that's thermal mass, so we use that passive strategy here. Another strategy we use is, here is radiant heating. So we are using the solar hot water and then uh, run that water onto the floor and we heat up the uh, floor. Actually, it's a very very common technology in South Korea, which uh, where I'm from, but it's very rare in this country. Uh, and uh, I try to use that technology through my experience in my home country. So. This is the first project that actually our office uh, designed this system. Yes. Have you seen much design of that for retrofitting renovation projects? For radiant floor heating. Or radiant, any type of heating. Through. Yeah, it's very difficult for the, um, the, the retrofit projects because basically once you put down the uh, pipe, you have to cover up with more topping concrete layer. Then all of a sudden your building you know, elevation kind of gets changed then your doors are screwed up and your stairs are actually uh, screwed up. So this radium floor heating, unless that is already there that you have to replace it, it's, it's, it's not an easy technology for renovation. I recently saw radiant heating. Wall uh, panels or ceiling. For, yeah, yeah. ceiling. It's called panels. chilled beam uh, or radium panel heating. Yes, that's another way. but. It's better for the flooring. I mean, it's still efficient. And actually, I am using that radium floor heating at, a, at another project, actually the, the, the transit facility project that I just showed you. Um, but this floor heating is much easier because uh, it warms up your body first, right? Because your, your body heats up here, and then the hot air rises up. So it heats up the space that we occupy first, then heating up the high space that we are not occupying. Um, again, selective glazing, so we are not just using whole clear glass or whole low glass everywhere. You can see this uh, shadowing device here for the lower glass, but then the higher glass, which is daylight glass, we use actually translucent, um, about 30% light transmittance glass, so it doesn't bring in natural, uh, the direct sunlight, it diffuses the light. The reason that we did not use that curved light shelf that we patented is because this is uh, the uh, the creative arts shops that that their program is clay studio, uh, wood shop, and and fabric shop and things like that. They create a lot of dust. Mm -hmm. So even if you create this interior light shelf, the dust accumulates it and it just messes up our light reflectance. So we considered that program. So we decided to use this strategy for this building. The natural ventilation stack effect. We also use this uh, stack effect strategy here. Because of this hilly site, the front side is two story, but the back side is only one story high. Okay, every each wing. So we used uh, this natural ventilation scheme that we use this uh, large chimney, and then we placed actually skylight at the top. I told you skylight is worse, and so I should not use it. But uh, skylight, the reason that we used over here is again to expedite this thermal flow. So intentionally, I wanted to heat up this top space faster so the, the cool air can actually uh, can be drawn through this chimney faster and then move the air to encourage and to uh, facilitate the natural ventilation more. <coughs> I, I noticed, sir, that we ought to be teaching fluid dynamics. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's a very um, yeah, good program. And this is a real cool. shot of that uh, building again. 
So this is a two-story you know, studio on the south side. And so you can see the south side windows and light shelves and overhangs here. The north side with that uh, stack effect chimney here with the louvers and stuff. Uh, and also with the integrated design process, we worked with the faculty members and also students to, to find out what their comfort level for the thermal uh, comfort. So they actually told us, we don't need, usually the engineers just follow the engineer's guideline. So no matter where the building is, they just said, yeah, cooling is 76 degrees and heating is 71 degrees. They do that all the time. Um, I, we actually talked to the occupants and they said, actually our, our old building that we are in right now, our uh, cooling system sucks. <laughs> and he, they said, we just, we are very tolerant to heat. And they said, you know, and we are very committed to energy saving. So from our experience, we don't mind actually tolerating probably uh, with about 78 degrees instead of 76 degrees. So they told us, Mr. Engineers, do not design the cooling system for 76. The shop areas, you know, it's a shop area. So they just, so they said 78 degrees is okay. So we worked with the occupants and then you know, through that process, we could reduce the, the cooling system size because of their commitment, okay? Um, so these, these are some uh, numbers of uh, the solar systems. Probably you don't get the gist of it, what, what that means. Uh, but this is kind of the step process that we did. So again, um, like 2030 challenge, we also look at the existing building stock average. So we looked at the average college buildings in Southeast and Mid-Atlantic mid area, and it was about 120,000 BTU per square per year, okay? But don't, I mean, forget about that BTU square per year, but just remember this number. And then if we were to design the building based on just code minimum, then that could have been down to 103,000, okay? Then, you know, in our state, there's a legislation that we have to design the buildings a certain percentage of energy efficiency than the code, okay? That was adopted in 2003 as a Senate Bill 668. So that requirement actually puts us down to 72,000 BTU. That's, that's the code requirement, the law requirement in our state. So with our, uh, all this high insulation and day, daylighting and everything, we did everything that we could do. Still, we were at 90,000. So it was still over that center bill. The reason is because this building has a lot of equipment. It's very difficult to achieve energy efficiency for, uh, for buildings that have equipment like lab buildings, hospitals. And this one was one of them because they use a lot of wood equipment. Clay kilns, they just burn kilns, eight kilns just you know, all day long. So uh, that's why we could not achieve that efficiency. So then we just try to use this solar thermal. As I said, we are using that for cooling and heating which finally we could go down to 33%. And then the photovoltaic contributes to another uh, 17%. So we could cut 50%, okay? So that's, but then that's uh, with the plug loads, with all the equipment. If we set aside the, the plug loads, and, only just, and then only thinking about the building, actually the, the reduction is almost uh, 75%. But that's how we met the 2030 challenge. So this graph shows how we could come down from 120 kBTU to all the way to the other way. The, uh, case two is uh, an existing building because I emphasize the existing building today. Um, this is a TVA a Chattanooga office. It's a huge office complex and it's a TVA building, which is a utility company, right? So they are sensitive about energy. And when they did this building many years ago, what they put, put in is, and you can see this area of view, it looks like actually photovoltaics or solar panels. Actually, they are all skylights. Mm. Okay? Uh, and then actually they had some, this really good kind of modern design of these concrete uh, baffles here outside to shadow those and then have top window and then view windows here. So the facade design was not bad. The problem was that those big skylights in the, in the atrium. 
So this is kind of a shot of the atrium, and you know what the space is is they have this big uh, atrium, and they thought they could bring in lights into these office areas, which are the perimeter perimeters of the building. The problem was that this atrium was heating a lot, and you know because of these wrong strategies, it didn't bring in enough daylight into the office spaces. So it it just illuminated this central area a lot, but it didn't bring in. So uh, they hired us, and we went there, and then we actually installed 20 sensors. The reason that we installed these sensors was because we wanted to verify our computer software's capability. We use, we use this DaySim software on every project for, for daylighting design, but we still wanted to kind of verify um, that um, capability. So we put those sensors at uh, six locations, and then we collected that data for, for many months. And then, again, same thing. We did a day sim and an energy model. And on top of that, we wanted to verify our energy model uh, capability, too, and accuracy, too. So we got the uh, energy bills from the owner. And then we got all of the equipment and all of the you know, current design information from the owner and then recalibrated our energy modeling software to be, to be sure that uh, the actual uh, energy consumption they are, uh, they are actually consuming is, is coming out through this energy modeling if we input every condition uh, as existing conditions. So this kind of shows you um, the four, uh, four uh, locations of the daylighting. And it's hard to see, but just you can uh, you can tell one is our simulation graph, and the other one is our measurement from actual sensors. And you can see that the discrepancy is not that much. So through this process, we were sure that our our modeling system is is valid. And um, then then we could design the new improved system and then run the daylighting software, and then recommend it to the owner, okay? So we went through the same strategy um, for the uh, energy modeling validation, okay? So this is the Equest uh, validation model uh, shot again. And again, um, the simulated is this, I don't know on your screen what color you're sure seeing, what kind of red, red uh, line here. And then blue and here is uh, the actual energy consumption of 2008 and 2009. And you can see a little bit of discrepancy here, but the discrepancy is about you know, less than 10%, which is marginal. So we were sure that our energy modeling uh, was uh, dependent. So, um, so we could actually then now design and then recommend some options to the owner. So one option that we suggested was, you know, with the skylight, this was a whole skylight. And we assumed, we actually proposed that actually blocking the middle section because it was uh, bringing in too much, too much light. And then change these, the, the rest of it with the more translucent ones so it doesn't bring in uh, direct sunlight. <clears throat> so those are, and then also as an option, uh, on top of that, we actually uh, proposed this, these ex exterior fins and then they are angled and actually motorized. So during the winter time, still you can kind of open up, and then during the summer time, you can close it uh, and then shadow it. Actually, not closing it, but to shadow it, so it doesn't bring in direct sun, direct sunlight and heat. But that option was, we knew actually was going to be too expensive, and through the life cycle, it was not going to be paid back. So the owner actually did not use it. So uh, then we did uh, the the daylighting simulation. And these are now showing kind of improved lighting. You, you might actually wonder how we actually approved this, I mean, improved this, because even with this direct sunlight with whole glass, still they were not getting enough daylighting into the office. But how did we actually improve by reducing the, 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 the glazing amount and also changing to translucent glazing, right? The, the reason we could do it is, uh, I believe, yes, here. Uh, actually, what we decided to do is we um, had, what they had was in the atrium, it was kind of open space, 
And as you can see, there was this kind of curved um, kind of you know, light shelf, and this is this is atrium. So when you know, they thought when sun light comes in and it was going to bounce back, and then the light actually goes down. That was uh, that was their system, and I'm sure uh, I had sections through there. Yes. So what we decide was the problem was that uh, oh I'm sorry the the existing building the problem was that this this first part was really kind of bright about just a first workstation, mm -hmm. but then still this this strategy didn't work very well. So um, kind of middle section was not you know, very well daily, okay, and um, they still actually could see actually glare because they. What they did was they painted over here really uh, bright white, and you know because of this angle, sometimes when this one hit, it still you know went back directly to people's eyes, and they had the glares and stuff. So what we decided to do is is um, here we kind of introduced these uh, fabric baffles that uh, I showed you the section that, uh, previously, and so that kind of blocks that uh, the view of that direct sunlight here, and then. Uh, what we did was actually it's, it, this section does not uh, show very well. What we did was actually we kind of added another piece over here. Uh, you know, my sketch is not exact, but we added another piece here because this this curve shape tends to actually f kind of bounce more kind of focused instead of more distributed. Mm -hmm. So we added actually another panel inside of it to make it actually even better, and then. Um, and then actually this, this sharp angle is reduced by that and also we added the first one or two rows of fabric baffles so it still kind of penetrates a little more so this is actual shot of that atrium space as you see just lots of direct sunlight here and then this is our rendering uh, with a soft lighter uh, soft light with a, a little bit of fan up there another uh, rendering that we did so that's kind of light quality that we kind of brought in. Um, so, and then we looked at some other things that they could do, like uh, other than daylighting, the lighting system, and then uh, some of the equipment changes. So from that level, you know, that could go down more and more uh, to be more energy efficient. So in the, in the existing building, with just simple daylighting strategy change, they could save quite quite good amount of um, um, saving. Okay. And then on top of that, we uh, I, I do not have just time to go through all these uh, alternates, but we recommended some other things and they could actually go down even further and further. And so eventually, if they did all these alternates that we recommended, they could reduce about 33% of reduction. And then also, of course, uh, we ran all these payback analysis and that's, that's what we, we did for this project. So um, I know I'm, I'm supposed to finish up at 3.30. So uh, I know it was a long, long process. But again, uh, let me just emphasize one thing. I know I covered a lot of stuff that we designers do. Uh, and I tried to show you what, what the real um, kind of integrative design process is and try to give you all these aspects uh, from your owner's perspective, OK? so. If you become an owner's rep again, I hope this, this, this uh, presentation actually gave you some perspectives that you can at least ask intelligent questions to your design team so you just don't rely on them doing all this work without informing you. That's why I said at the very beginning, the owner and even the facility manager, and sometimes actually we bring in the janitors too because they are the one who cleans up and paints and, and stuff. So we bring them at least to the design meetings and then tell them these are the designs that we do. Don't paint uh, dark colors here and there because then you're going to screw up. Uh, so he understands those. Um, so again, if you become an owner, please remember these things are actually popping up there. And uh, you can request these to your design team and also, if you become a facility manager, 
you know and you understand these issues. Okay? All right, and then take off your hat and just put your student's hat again on and then ask me questions. Yes. Uh, this is going back to the start of your presentation, but you talked about with the integrative design process, I was wondering, comparing that to the conventional design, it would obviously be a bit more of a economically, like it, it's a more of an expensive process because you're involving all those people at the same time for the process. Is that initial investment justified by the reduced construction time? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, yes and no. Uh, the reason why I say that is because um, personally and our company, our fee is just the same. Okay? Because we committed ourselves to using these daylight and simulation tools and the energy modeling tools as a design decision-making process. If we do not run that, we cannot make a good design. So even if the owner says, no, I don't need energy modeling, or he says, well, I don't need a daylight, we still do that. Um, however, a lot of kind of starting companies are relatively new to this green building market. Yes, they kind of try to identify energy modeling services as an additional service. Um, and also the daylighting simulation and even lead documentation too. Okay. Lead documentation is a little bit above and beyond what we usually do in terms of paperwork. So yes, we also kind of charge that. Um, and But on the other hand, the reason that we do not charge these to the owners is because still we, the owners are not educated well on all these benefits. So they just think that if we try to charge more, then they think they are expensive architects. Then we cannot get the projects. Right? So in order to just, to, to be honest, in order to be competitive, we do not actually increase our, fry, uh, our fee, the design yeah. fee. So it's the same. But you know, CM at risk or design build, uh, I, I kind of see the trend that if it becomes a CM at risk and the CM is involved during the design process and Actually, like U.S. Army, for instance, they already kind of know that the green building projects cost more for the design, even even design a little bit. So they actually set aside a little bit more uh, contingency, design contingency, and also the soft cost one percent more. Okay, I mean, it, and also our state state construction office. If if you build a, a campus building over here, the state construction, they will say, yeah, hire a commissioning agent. And the commissioning agent fee is usually 1% or 1.5% of the construction fee, I mean, construction cost. So the so state construction also knows that that costs more. Does that answer? Yeah, it does. How do you justify that to an owner, though? Because if they had the choice, obviously you've got the initial investment and the payback period in a more efficient building. Mm -hmm. But the difference between going for the conventional approach, because I'm thinking of it in the context that you have the architect uh, architect working for say a two month period and then the engineers are also going to be with him and all the different faculties rather than working for a three week period just as an example so it's obviously going to be a little bit longer and quite a bit more expensive you know actually to be honest actually if i if i track down the hours that we spend as as we know and as we have experienced uh, it doesn't take a lot more more hours once you get used to all this process. The reason is, as I showed you that, that bar graph here, the overall length is just almost yeah. the same. It's just these first two parts is longer. Okay? Because the, the reason that it takes a lot longer here is a lot of design changes still happens during the construction documents. And the details are already kind of semi-developed or halfway developed. And if, if the, uh, the design you know, decision is not made that, that time yet, and then this decision is made at that time, then they have to go back and change the details, which takes more time for the designers to, to change. If the, all the decisions are made over here with a very well-informed decisions, then the, 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 the frequency of changing still happens sometimes, but frequency of changing the design at this end is a lot less. So, you know, I, I don't have really clear science or, uh, you know, uh. data of, this is exactly how many hours versus this is exactly how many hours. But 
our experience is since we've done a lot of projects through this way, you know, we don't see it as, as a lot more hours. Yes, sir. Just if you want a way of thinking about this, think uh, product, uh, con uh, concurrent product design. And there's an immense literature in manufacturing on co concurrent product design. What you find is that you may involve a lot more people early on, but changes are really early easy to make and cheap early on, and they're really expensive later on in the process. And so what you find uh, is that uh, typically, in fact, you considerably reduce uh, design costs by bringing the various parties to bear uh, early on, as opposed to designing something and throwing it to somebody else and saying, do this, yeah. and then finding out that it can't be done. So uh, I, th I think I, I would love to work with you on uh, modeling some of that. Okay. But I think that there's uh, there is a very good body of literature to look at in in product design. Yes. So do you see a lot of construction firms, or at least a certain sector of the construction firms, moving towards specifically focusing on the IDP? Yes, um, I, I, I would say not a lot at this point, but I have a good friend of mine who works at uh, Skanska, which is international large firm. And they use this process significantly right now. Uh, I mean, I know you, you guys heard about BIM a lot, and everybody is now talking about BIM. And, and BIM is a good tool to achieve this integrated design process, but eventually, as I said, more important, I mean, BIM is basically one model that everybody can look at, which is exactly information modeling, right? So when you, when you look, you know, hear this quote, information, basically information flow between the team members. As I said, document, the reason I kept emphasizing documentation of all these decision making and, and all uh, the, the, the uh, information process is because of that. The BIM model has the information that you built in, but then it still doesn't document how and why we made that decision, right? So all this process that I emphasize today is actually backing up that BIM, uh, BIM model, okay? So, um, yeah, the contractors are even now hiring some of the, uh, the designers now. And, you know, I've, I've, I've read a, a literature from actually AIA about a year ago that they were predicting, you know, in 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 near future, uh, as the way this industry goes, probably the role of architect is is probably more towards the, the coordinator role than actually purely kind of design role itself. I mean, we're going to still design buildings, but you know, it's going to be much less and less, and then coordinating. But you know, I, I always have a conversation with Professor An, and he always gives me this uh, insight from the uh, contractor standpoint. And you know, I can see that actually contractors are trying to, well, to be honest, actually to protect our uh, our market. The con contractors are trying to actually encroach into architects' roles these days because of this integrated delivery project delivery process. Um, isn't that sort of digressing? as a profession because really architect means master builder, mm -hmm. right? So Should you're be. seeing, yeah, yeah. So you're seeing, you know, maybe architect went into purely design, right? And now they're moving back towards master builder. Exactly. And you see the construction side saying, okay, we need to understand the design yeah. side and exactly. the meeting of professionals, mm -hmm. recognizing that the master builder skill set is almost required. Let me ask you back. Um, are you undergraduate or grad? Undergraduate. Undergrad. So if you are offered a graduate program, that actually combines these multiple disciplines. Because as I said, it might have to you know, combine architecture school, engineering school, construction management school, all together and then create a probably architect studio program. So the architect still designs a studio project but still, he works with mechanical engineering student and maybe, you know, construction management student. And then they create some project that is not just a cool design. Would that be attractive to you? That is extremely attractive. Good. That is, I mean, I, do you know of a, pro, of, a, of a program like that? <laughs> well, not many. Not many. Actually, I, you know. But you do know of some. Well, I know some schools that are trying to do. Okay. 
uh, to be honest, actually, academic side is, is a little bit behind than the market trend right now in terms of that, I think. Yes. I was just going to say, with my program back home, our base year, we've got project management subjects, architecture management, um, property construction, and then property as well to like try and give us exposure to all industries. So we literally have to design our houses as well as understand the formatting and all the grades for actually being a construction manager as well. But that's literally just in one year before we specialise. Go to Australia. <laughs> well, I was just wondering, why is America still better than Australia? I don't understand. It's getting ahead of us. All right, I'm going to stick around a little bit longer if you have more personal questions or something, but uh, i got to wrap up, I think. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I keep wondering where it occurred. Like, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>